Hi, I'm Bob Doyle, webcasting from my ITV studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm also the information philosopher at my website, informationphilosopher.com. And today on Thursday, um, I think I can be called the metaphysicist, uh, and I'll refer you to my website, metaphysicist.com. Today is a Thursday, and that means we're going to be dealing with uh, metaphysics. My topic today is taken from my book, Metaphysics, which I think, I hope you'll be able to read either by buying the book at a local bookstore or Amazon, or for those who really can't afford a book and don't really need one to mark up like I do, all the books I own are heavily annotated and so forth, you can get this book on informationphilosopher.com slash books or a similar link on metaphysicist.com. So the subject we're dealing with today is uh, one of the, uh, the, the paradoxes. I'm a little tight on this screen. Let me back off just a little bit. Uh, this book is full of problems and paradoxes and puzzles. And I think I rate uh, our discussion today, uh, which is going to be on the ship of Theseus, an ancient Greek problem in uh, identity, and um, a modern uh, development of a, the idea of a ship, uh, that of the Vienna Circle uh, scientist or really philosopher Otto Neurath. So let's see what I can do by bringing this up here and putting my um, description of today's metaphysics lecture up on the screen behind me. Theseus is an ancient story, and Otto Neurath is a story from around the 1920s. Really fascinating fellow. Uh, I've just today finished a web page on Neurath, or Neurath, I think the Germans may have said, at informationphilosopher.com, and you can go down the left-hand side of the screen, and you should be able to find uh, him there. Let's just take a look at that for just a moment uh, because I hope to explain to you that what I lecture on, what I speak to you on, or talk about an idea is, is very limited in its ability to transfer information, uh, in my opinion, for someone who wants to get that information deeply and learn a lot about it. Uh, there's no substitute for going and reading uh, about, uh, in this case, Otto Neurath, either on my site, I hope you'll start there, but then go to the really wonderful page uh, on uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, and a more minimal page on the Wikipedia. But as we scroll down, see all the philosophers I've, I've worked on uh, in the last 20 years, and we should get to the ends, and somewhere there we should find, wow, right next to Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, let me take that full screen so you can see what we're doing. And I would basically click on Neurath, and here we come. And I can zoom in a little bit, or I can just scroll over perhaps. And I point, I see here that Neurath was a founding member of the Vienna Circle. So we'll come to him in just a minute, but we want to start today with. Uh, the combined ships, one for, for the ancient Theseus and the other for the modern Otto Neurath. The, the ship of Theseus was a famous vessel, I say here. And then I have a quote from Plutarch, um, which is one of our sources for the, who is one of our sources for the great ideas of the ancient Greeks. And you know, we touched on um, a, 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 the problem that's raised by the ship of Theseus a week ago when we discussed the necessity of identity and the problem of individuation. So if you look at my lecture from week eight for metaphysics, you'll find uh, something there will help you to situate why I'm worrying about such a problem uh, since it's a rather intellectual uh, sort of thing, a metaphysicist sort of thing, far away from the work I do uh, you would think far away from the work I do in physics and or cosmology and or psychology, but it's not too far because it really focuses in on what it is to constitute something. What is it to be? What is it to be a thing? 
what is it about that thing that makes it uh, the individual thing it is? And what is it that uh, gives it it its uh, absolute identity, as it's called? Uh, when is identity something we can say that is the absolute identity of that individual? And it's what makes that entity into an individual. And we could say it makes that entity into an identity. It's a lovely play on words there uh, because uh, it's, it's not exactly good uh, linguistics, but it is uh, memorable that you and I and every living being, every human being, every living being, uh, as uh, the great philosopher of biology Ernst Meyer used to say, um, it appears that every living cell has differences, however minor, which make each and every one of our hundred billions of cells individuals. They are not exactly alike. So they don't even have a relative identity. Uh, you remember that absolute identity can only be true of an object or a thing itself. Uh, identity of the absolute kind is always a self-identity. Uh, I have that identity, uh, although uh, philosophers who are metaphysicians, metaphysicists, I call myself, they call themselves typically metaphysician. I like to emphasize metaphysicist because I have this background in quantum physics and cosmology and I bring that in, but I'm trying to deal with the same problems that people are writing about in metaphysics today. And it has, uh, metaphysics has a, a growth in the last 10, 20, 30 years, which it did not have most of the 20th century when it was being um, uh, attacked by Otto Neurath. Okay, so I see that I've got the wrong screen up behind me right here. Let me put this uh, screen for the ship of Theseus and come back to uh, what the ancients were talking about when they wondered about the identity of the, of the famous ship of Theseus. So let me bring this to full screen and read what, they, what uh, Plutarch, the great Plutarch, had to say about this ship. The ship wherein Theseus and the youth of Athens returned had 30 oars, and it was preserved by the Athenians down even to the time of Demetrius Phalereus, for they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting in new and stronger timber in their place, insomuch that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers for the logical questions, question as to things that grow, one side holding that the ship remained the same and the other contending it was not the same. Okay. Um, in my metaphysics book, uh, let's come back to my overview of it just a moment, you'll see that the thoughts that are being represented there, even by Plutarch, have to do with questions of, of change. Uh, and if I zoom in a little tighter on my, this page, you'll see I have uh, questions of what is change? Uh, what are two objects in the same place called coinciding objects? What is the composition of an object that bears on the issue of the ship? The question is, what is the ship composed of? And when they build it, it has one particular beginning with the original planks and it sets into sail on the, across the Aegean on uh, its maiden voyage. It has one composition. Apologize for the shaking screen. Those are my grandchildren jumping up and down on the second floor of my studio, my house here. Uh, the question of constitution, right? Uh, what is a uh, constitution uh, and does it give us identity? In other words, is identity, identity purely a question of uh, constitution? So those are some of the questions that uh, metaphysicists raise. And if I look at the particular ones that I, I call uh, puzzles, you'll see that many of them have to do with this, this ship. Dion and Theon are two names for the same person, uh, but one of whom has lost a leg in ancient time. And they argue about, well, what happened with the loss of Theon's leg? Is he no longer Dion, or how do we describe that? Uh, I'll jump over Frege's puzzle, which uh, is really a very interesting one. 
uh, that's about the morning star and evening star that we've talked about a little bit, uh, called Hesperus and Bosphorus, and two names for the planet Venus. But the growing argument is the thing that is uh, perhaps most important for the ship because the ship is changing. And the reason it is changing is because the planks are uh, rotting and, and leaking and some of those bad planks have to be taken out and new planks put in. And the question then becomes one of identity. Is this still the same ship? Um, um, we'll read more about that in just a minute, but I just want to point out, let's see, Porphyry's question. Here is the ship of Theseus in chapter 31. For those of you who want to see more than we're going to be able to present today, uh, and in particular, uh, I have a couple of uh, addenda to the, the basic issue we are going to discuss. Um, I will talk about how we resolve the paradox, but then the question is, how do you make two ships out of one? Uh, the statue and the clay is another question similar to Dion and Theon and sh similar to the ship of Theseus. The question here is, you make a statue out of material. The material is the clay. The statue can be seen as the form or the shape. And the ancients worried a great deal about what uh, was the contribution of, of the material to an object and what was the contribution of the form. Uh, you should recognize that I'm going to point out the form as the uh, kind of essence uh, of, of something in the sense of being an immaterial idea, whereas the clay is very clearly the material substance. <clears throat> and when we try to divide those two things, uh, we are deeply into the metaphysical problem of what is the relation between the form and the content of an object. Or, it turns out, even in abstract metaphysics and abstract philosophy, we could talk about an, an idea, uh, that is to say a concept, which need not have any material object associated. Or, as Aristotle put it, we can abstract away from many objects. Um, lots of horses, for example. We can abstract away the concept of horse, uh, which you who are familiar with Plato will remember he argued was the idea of a horse, and it was more real than any uh, imitation horse, that is to say a real horse, uh, a living horse. <clears throat> and he went on, Plato did in his mode as a, an aesthetic, a critic of aesthetics, to point out that all of art uh, in which painters paint horses or um, uh, statues of horses are made, in the case here we have the statue of the clay, um, that the sculptor who makes a statue is making an imitation of an imitation, a living horse, which is an imitation of the live, of the, uh, the platonic idea in the real world uh, of ideals and ideas and so forth. Tibbles the cat is a similar one with a more charming name. And so, there's more for you to find in this book. I hope you'll uh, be looking at it uh, from time to time, either in paper or on my website, either the Metaphysicist website or the Information Philosopher website. Okay, so we come back to this statement from Plutarch. Plutarch says this ship is growing, and what he means by that is it's changing over time. Uh, the issue, of course, was often human beings who are clearly growing over time, developing uh, from a baby to an adult, a grown-up. And the metaphysicists worry about the question of whether uh, an 81-year-old version of Bob Doyle is the same Bob Doyle who was going to Brown and taking his first classes in philosophy in the 1950s. Uh, and to me, this remains a kind of question that, that's asked a lot. L huge volumes are being written on this subject today uh, with titles like metaphysics or new problems in metaphysics, which are almost always old problems in metaphysics in uh, new bottles, as they say, or new journals, new publications. Metaphysics is a very ap active subject at this moment in uh, academic philosophy. Uh, but then what, what, what does it mean to say uh, there's a, the identity of a person? Uh, and I believe the answer is to be found in our information. Uh, because as I've told you before, and I hope you're getting a handle on this now, and maybe you can tell others about this, our matter is being constantly changed. Our 
Red blood cells are dying, 200 million every second. It's astonishing to hear those numbers. To me, biological numbers are enormous compared to what I, as a graduate student, used to call astronomical numbers. Astronomical numbers are in the billions. Uh, we have billions of years. We have uh, billions of galaxies. But in a human being, we have hundreds of billions of, of our own cells, uh, 10 billion uh, neurons that are helping me think and formulate what I want to say to you right now, coming out of past experiences. My experience recorder is providing me the reproduction of older thoughts or slightly new ones that I'm putting together parts of sentences that I don't even know how the sentence will end when I start it. These are all a very important understanding of what it is to be a thinking being. But the information that's providing uh, my uh, things to say uh, is my experience recorder and reproducer, which is the basis for my model of a mind. And it's also uh, a description of uh, the solution to the problem of consciousness. If I did not have experiences coming to me when I react to other things going on, um, it would mean I perhaps, perhaps I'm not conscious of those things happening. I, I, I've not had the experiences to take some new thing happening and give it a context, provide it a meaning. Uh, but when I grow older, I have had some experiences of something or other, and those will be recalled at the perhaps uh, subconscious level below the uh, conscious stream that William James described, which describes my uh, <laughs> ra ra you know, rambling on from thought to thought right now. There, that's the stream of consciousness. But there's a subconscious that could at any moment pay attention to something else. For example, I might look, oh, I'm supposed to be talking about what Plutarch just said, and I've wandered off the subject with you. That's a typical uh, image of what William James had in mind for the mind. The mind is a blooming, buzzing confusion at one level, and it then occasionally uh, ideas float up to the conscious stream, and they are injected in the stream, just like I brought in Plutarch. So uh, with all that as background, uh, let's go back to say uh, what happens when something changes. This really bothered the Greeks, uh, partly because the Stoics, who were the dominant uh, philosophical school, uh, we're talking maybe second century in the Common Era, um, the arguments by the academic skeptics, uh, remember the academy was the Platonic Academy, uh, the Lyceum was Aristotle's school, and the Stoics had their stoa, and they developed their ideas. These were all physical locations in Athens. Uh, their buildings uh, rather complex in some cases with a lot of walk-around space uh, and a lot of places to sit down and have uh, philosophical discussions. Uh, it's wonderful how um, the academy, what, before we have the modern ac academy of, of academic philosophers, who are so professional and, and narrow and focused on a niche that is their own niche. In those days, these were the first thinkers sitting around trying to deeply understand the nature of reality and what it meant to be a, a, spe a, a, a speaking person. Plato thought Socrates was the epitome of a philosopher because he spoke and he talked to his students. He discussed things with them, he encouraged them to criticize him, he criticized them. The so-called Socratic method was a question and answer and a question and mostly with Socrates it was a question and then no answer, as in uh, he had what we could call a negative dialectic. He had a negative attitude towards knowing anything. Uh, question whether anyone knew anything in a way that he could or she could prove it. Uh, uh, those questions, the uh, Socratic attitude towards uh, knowledge uh, comes right down to the present day. How we justify what we know, uh, talking about knowledge as epistemology, uh, and that's uh, understanding that comes in a discourse, um, not just a monologue like mine, but someday I hope this show will turn into a lectures where I have guests, I have students, and I have colleagues who want to go over these things together. Um, it'll be a more enjoyable lecture, I hope, 
but for now, I'm just starting. This is lecture number 44. And I just have to wait and look for uh, bringing in guests by my Skype. I have two complete Skype setups here to allow people to visit uh, in the future. OK, so we're roaming around a bit. But the question of growth and what does growth do to identity is what's here for us today. In the Theseus ship, it was, it was leaking. It had to have its planks removed. And those planks were uh, replaced. And the question is, is the repaired ship identical in some sense with the uh, original ship and its maiden voyage? That's basically the question. Now, it wasn't Plutarch, and it wasn't really the, um, the, uh, the Greeks who described the ship of Theseus in this way, although they did concern themselves with the statue in the clay and what happens when it changes. Uh, and they had examples of things uh, in the case of the statue uh, they imagine an arm breaking off, uh, like the leg of uh, Dion falling off and becoming Theon and so forth. Uh, so that was a very simple kind of change. But when you have a change, what happens to identity? Uh, today, uh, the most radical thinking of change uh, causing a loss of identity are, uh, I find in some philosophers who imagine that the dimension of time uh, is a dimension not unlike space in the sense that every tick can be considered another position in time. And the mere change in position, uh, change of a moment in time, they arguably think reproduces another per person, that there is no continuity of identity, no temporal identity. Because clearly, it's in, my, in my model of how we change, we've got uh, hundreds of millions uh, of, of red blood cells going away, needing to be replaced, inside of which there are 300 million hemoglobin, uh, each with uh, 300 amino acids. And so all of those have changed at a rate high, much higher than any data rate in a computer. And one can argue, well, clearly that's not me. Uh, if I've changed so much of me, uh, that's their argument. My argument is, no, that's nonsense. That's clever thinking, but it doesn't describe what could be arguably the essence. So I have a chapter on essence. And the essence of a person, to me, clearly, is not to be found in the momentary material uh, content of our body. Uh, it is instead our identity is found, in my view, in our information, which is to say the particular arrangement of the atoms and molecules uh, which have been put there under the control of information. In other words, I am an information processing, information managing system in which the information is being kept over time. So I can distinctly remember the classroom in 1956 where uh, Kurt Dukas was up on the stage talking about using mescaline to have these hallucinatory experiences which he thought were at the root of almost all religion creations. Uh, very inspiring, wonderful old lecturer. Uh, the, that I have some image of that, uh, I have particular images of a box uh, which had a light in it that he could turn the light on and off by doing things to it and uh, ask questions about was he controlling it or was someone else controlling it and so forth. Those images are here in my mind, despite the fact that the neurons themselves have had their internal parts being replenished. Uh, neurons don't exactly die, but they too have material change. Uh, indeed, ions are flowing across, in and out across the cell boundary, uh, which are seen as electrical impulses that move along my neurons. And they then play back uh, in my experience recorder and reproducer. They cause, when some neurons fire, they cause uh, other experiences that are wired into that part of the uh, neocortex where the, the neurons are now firing, and they bring ideas to mind. Um, I mean, very physically, uh, specifically, uh, if uh, in a neuroscience um, experiment and we open the skull and, and probe with an electrical probe in and around in parts of the neocortex, um, people 
quite frequently experience different things that they know about and they see them again and they think of them again and so forth. It, this is not a, a radical theory that, of mine that neurons that have been wired together by Donald Hebb's thought will fire together as a complex, a complex idea, a complex experience if it's electrically stimulated by a new experience with some resemblance to the old, okay? So the new experience comes in and maybe it just contains the smell of the old experience or it just contains the visual of something and yet the whole experience in my model comes back because neurons that were wired together in Hebbian thinking uh, will now fire together and bring back the old experience. That is my basis for uh, the idea that we have meaning, that we have a context from our old experiences to wrap around whatever is happening now and giving, give us a sense of being conscious of what's going on and give us uh, the, the meaning of what's going on so that we can then deal with what's going on. And bottom line, most important, what plays back is accompanied by the emotions that we had when those earlier experiences were first recorded. Uh, that tells us that the way we react to the world depends in part on the way the world, what the world did to us in our youth, in our development over time. Because um, we've got the DNA that gives us our nature, but then the nurture over the development of our lives makes us who we are by uh, recording emotional experiences, good or bad, along with other things that we see in the world. And we then become, uh, a, philosophers call it, uh, we, we become an organism that can see uh, how things look and how they are for us as individuals. The great problem of what it's like to be uh, uh, a bat, in the case of uh, Thomas Nagel's uh, famous essay, what it's like to be a bat is uh, reacting to echoes off walls, which we cannot do. Uh, human beings don't have sonar equivalent and have uh, echoes bouncing off walls, which give the bat, bat the information to realize where they are, be, a, be aware of, and, and bats are conscious, no doubt about it in my view, uh, of where they are in the environment. Uh, we have similar things coming in and they cause our playback system, our record, reproducer system, to provide us with the what we need to know at that moment. Because what it's like to be a human being is to be constantly aware of the meaning of what's happening to us uh, by this playback of my experience recorder and reproducer, giving us meaning, uh, being the model for consciousness, being the solution to David Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness, uh, which is what it's like to see red for you and what it's like for uh, me to see red and so forth, the qualia so-called, the looks that seem so subjective and personal, they're all inside us. And they're inside us because they were developed there over our development from the time we were born, so forth. All right, once again, distracted. I've got to get back to our ship. And it turns out the... Uh, the person who posed this problem of the ship of Theseus is actually the relatively modern philosopher Thomas Hobbes. So let's see what he had to say about this. In his book, his work De Corpora, about the body, about, the, about matter, Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes followed up, followed up on an ancient suggestion that the ship's original planks might have been hoarded by a collector on land and even reassembled, okay? Once every uh, let's see, and, uh, and once every part had been replaced, um, Hobbes then offered the reassembled ship as the true original, okay? But he may have had his tongue in his cheek about the ambiguous use of language and truth claims uh, because it is the true original as, I, I say, like to say, with respect to its matter, but not qua or with respect to it being a functioning ship. And you'll see now how, I'm, you, you probably guess how I'm gonna go ahead and solve this problem by thinking in terms of, of information. What information is in the old planks that were leaky and probably would never function 
a well as a ship in the future, very unlikely that if there they are all assembled on land, but if you push it in the water, it's very likely to sink very quickly, the original ship, the true original ship. And we can say it's the original ship in time by looking at this temporal axis uh, of this ship, just like these philosophers who argue there's no temporal identity. Uh, you, we could agree with them that the original ship existed at the time it was launched and it sailed many times back and forth across the Aegean. Uh, and uh, at that time it was the ship of Theseus. And so it had an identity at that time as the ship of Theseus. And as soon as one plank was changed, however, you could argue with these people who don't like to allow identity to be temporal and travel along with us in time, which is to me a non-commonsensical attitude that I am somehow a different person every second. Um, but uh, then we can look at this idea of the current functioning, say, ship maybe 100 years, 200 years later after Theseus, he'd probably have a new captain. And you could ask, well, is uh, the ship of Theseus still the ship of Theseus when Theseus is no longer the captain sailing it? And uh, nor, not, not, that, not only that, but the original ship that she, Theseus did captain is now in dry dock storage somewhere. So how could the one that's sailing under a new captain be the ship of Theseus? Well. From an information philosophy perspective, this particular argument is just a puzzle. It's a quibble about naming. So it's sort of related to the naming problem of Venus in the morning, Venus in the evening, having two different names. But the full facts of the matter provide the information to name a ship uniquely. We have perfect information about the constituting planks, I write here, especially if they were carefully distinguished and stored for reassembly of the original planks as a museum copy, presumably, all reassembled from old planks. We, have, we can say we perfectly understand and have meaningful names for all the parts in this problem. We have the original ship, for example, you can have the original plank with a number on it, plank number 175. Then we have the repaired ship with specific replacement planks in position. We can keep a diagram, an informational diagram, which focuses on our fact that we do know where everything is. Remember, information philosophy goes all the way deep down to the positions of all the atoms within a material object, even a stone. In principle, we can know all of those. In practice, that's impossible. But because we can say the information is the arrangement of the atoms inside a physical material object, we've got a very solid definition. But when we do this, we now have the original uh, ship now in a museum, and we have it's reassembled. Uh, but we also have the currently functioning ship, so we have two numerically distinct ships. And numerical distinctness is the question I brought up a week ago on a uh, problem of uh, necessity of identity. Max Black imagined those two spheres, black spheres probably, because they had no properties whatsoever. Every property they had was identical by definition. Max Black's problem was to say, what if we have two identical spheres? And my solution to their problem, Max Black's problem, is to say, they are relatively identical in respect to all of their internal information. But they are only uh, relatively identical uh, with respect to their external information. Because the one sphere, there are two of them and nothing else in the universe, one can look out and see the other, and the other can look out and see the one. And they are numerically distinct, and that makes them only relatively identical. Uh, each of them on its own has absolute identity. So the, um, we've, we've discussed the problem of uh, the two ships now have a relative identity to the extent that the diagram to put them all together carries the same information. Each plank has numbered, is numbered. It's not down to the details of the atoms, which would be quite different. Uh, different planks would have rotted differently and so forth. But for our purposes, we can say they are almost as identical uh, as, the, as the Max Black spheres uh, with no other property except their radius and so forth. Uh, but they are definitely different and only relatively identical because one of them won't, sing, won't sail and the other one is being used every day. Okay, so we've dealt with the problem, 
problem of the, its identity through time. So let's spend a couple minutes with just another really famous ship, which is not a problem in metaphysics, but uh, Otto Neurath really got down to a very interesting level in his arguments with the other members of the Vienna Circle. Remember, uh, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein was perhaps its most famous member. Uh, Moritz Schlick was its uh, founder who took it over. Neurath and a couple of colleagues, a mathematician named Hans Hahn, I think, and uh, a physicist named Philip Frank, who was a good friend of Einstein. Einstein sometimes came and was very interested in the correspondence of the Vienna Circle. Uh, other great members, Karl Popper, came from time to time. Um, so there are a lot of, lot of interesting people. But Neurath was the original founder, way before it was called Vienna Circle. And then uh, Marit Schlick, Schlick took over sadly stayed in Nazi Germany a little too long. I think Neurath was out of there by the early 20s, uh, or early 30s, excuse me. And in 1936, a Nazi uh, youth went up and shot Moritz Slick uh, in public. He was arrested, and in, within a couple of weeks, that, that Nazi was being um, applauded for getting rid of a Jew, a uh, philosophical Jew. And within two years, the Nazis had erected a uh, memorial to the uh, killer uh, for having done the job of getting rid of Moritz Schlick. Very sad. Schlick was a wonderful person. I think I have a web page on Schlick. I definitely have them now on Neurath and Wittgenstein, of course, and Karl Popper. And I'm very interested in the attempt by the Vienna Circle to provide us what they called the unity of science, a kind of fundamental, clear basis for thinking about the world and, in particular, about how language uh, is used to describe the world. Uh, Neurath was very skeptical about the ability of words uh, to accomplish deep understanding as an epistemological problem. Um, and Neurath famously uh, preferred pictures to, uh, to, to, to talking. Uh, I hope you can see there that that's the basis, in, in a way, the foundation of my information philosophy. Uh, what, what he did, um, uh, so I've, I've said a couple of things about him here. Uh, the idea of communicating uh, ideas with pictures was a thing he called the Vienna method, uh, where is it here, uh, of, of uh, der Bildstatistik. Let's see if I can bring that up here so you can see it on the screen. The Vienna Method der Bildstatistik uh, is the Vienna Method of Picture Statistics, okay? And he argued that uh, he could, he, he, we should draw pictures of things. Now, uh, Wittgenstein took this very seriously, and in um, uh, his uh, Tractatus uh, Logical Philosophicus, he has pictures from time to time, and he argued, Wittgenstein argued, that pictures convey more information than words in German or English or whatever. There was a lot of debate about whether there was a perfect language or, or, or a preferred language in which to discuss philosophical problems. Uh, I, you won't be surprised to learn that the Germans thought that the German was the best language for philosophy far and away. The others, French and English, were horrible and unsuited to thinking about deep problems, although there were those who said we had to go back to the Greeks, like Martin Heidegger with his return to the problem of being, which was you know, the thing that worried uh, uh, Plato and Parmenides before him and so forth. So um, when uh, in Vienna, while well, he was in Vienna creating this Vienna method of build p uh, picture statistics, I should have some pictures here, and I hope to add some to his webpage, examples of what he did. And they're very simple. They look like an, an automobile, for example, seen from the back or from the front, so as to indicate that this lane you should not go because it's where the cars are coming toward us and so forth. A lot of very clever use. Uh, mostly, though, it, it was to provide statistics data for, the, for Austria. Uh, let's see, a, a little side note is that uh, Neurath was living in an area of Vienna in the 20s and into the 30s before, before Nazism took over, uh, which was called Red Vienna because the government for that uh, part of the city 
uh, with a socialist government, a socialist mayor like of a subset of Vienna. It was called Red Vienna. And there, uh, what Neurath was doing was publishing important factual information in the form of statistics, uh, but instead of writing a line with 1,723 autos or something, he would uh, put blocks of autos, each representing, say, so he'd have 17 of them representing each one 100 autos. And he had this line, which I think I quoted here maybe. Uh, no, I don't think I have it right here. But it's a line, something to the effect that um, one clear, imaginative, beautiful picture can teach more and be more memorable than uh, lines of numbers. <laughs> he was definitely opposed to numbers, just like he was worried about language, whereas pictures he thought resonated and put a deeper sense of knowledge into the, into the mind, as I would call it today. And I think I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that Ludwig Wittgenstein thought so too. And so he famously argued in his early work with Bertrand Russell, uh, Wittgen, Wittgenstein argued that uh, a, pictures, uh, a picture language is superior to a, a verbal language. And later he came to worry about whether language could represent knowledge at all because language is fundamentally ambiguous and so forth. And the second uh, wave of the second version of Wittgenstein in his later years when he founds much of analytic language philosophy is to worry about this possibility for getting to deep truths uh, using language. Okay, so uh, sometime, I'm not sure I have a date for this, um, Neurath uh, described a, a way of thinking about our knowledge. Uh, so it's a, he's being an epistemologist and he's saying, what is it that we know? How do we know it? And so forth. Uh, and deep down, the Vienna Circle was trying to say, what is there that we know? And how do we know what there is? That is to say, the ontological problem. That was always a very deep problem. British empiricists have said, and even uh, Immanuel Kant had said, uh, we're not sure that we ever get knowledge about the things themselves. Because all we really see is what we can perceive, what we can sense, we can touch, we can see. But it's not clear, they thought, from, you know, let's see, we're talking about the 18th century uh, right on through to much of the 19th century, the, uh, the worry, and then the 20th, the worry was that our perceptions are only secondary um, data compared to the real things that are generating that data. Uh, there's an enormous problem area in, in philosophy uh, that concerns the fact that uh, what we see, like the color red, uh, what we experience when we have a delicious taste of that Madeleine we talked about that inspired Marcel Proust to suddenly remember back his youth when he, uh, when his aunt or gave him these uh, petit Madeleines dipped in uh, tea, hot tea, and it produced a sensation of taste and smell, which from, from which came roaring back the house, the, his, his aunt, and the surroundings, and suddenly he saw the whole city around him when, from where he lived uh, as a young man in this famous work, Remembrance of Things Past. Uh, Proust is telling us a lot about what it is that brings back that past. Uh, and I think it's wonderful, sort of uh, delicious uh, uh, version of my experience uh, reproducer, because buried in Proust's mind, I think, uh, was the, uh, that experience, which came rushing back. All of the experiences uh, from his youth in that particular location came back when, as an older man, he tasted that, that little cookie, the beautiful little Madeleine. Okay, but back to Neurath, uh, and he too is really uh, worried about what we know, how we know it, and how it's coming into us, and what it consists of. It's the thing I, I now like to call my, my sum, my sum in the famous Cartesian comment, ego cogito ergo sum. Originally that was a statement about existence and, uh, uh, and deep knowledge that we could not be wrong about. We couldn't be deceived by some 
deceiving being that planted an idea in our mind that we don't exist, for example, he, we, he argued, oh, look, I'm thinking, cogito, I'm thinking, ergo, therefore, I am sum, uh, and that's the end of the story. Uh, unfortunately for Descartes, that wasn't exactly what one is allowed to conclude. Uh, the only thing you're really allowed to conclude from I'm thinking is something like thinking exists. Uh, whether we, <laughs> to what extent we exist as a thinking being remains a big question. But for Descartes, he famously said, got it, I've got something I can't doubt, and now I'm going to go out and build a uh, a knowledge base, a, a knowledge that uh, upon which I, if I build it on this one undoubtable thing, one indubitable bit of knowledge, the rest of it will be equally uh, undoubt, undoubtable, indubitable, and we can build up a whole set of knowledge all the way up to God in, in Descartes' work, and of course that was really a, just a crumble down like sand uh, in the hands or the minds of later thinkers, but um, we have uh, this notion of knowledge that we're building up, and today almost all philosophers are worried about, is there anything we could call a foundation under all of this uh, that we now know? Uh, we certainly know that we know a great deal more than those who came before us. Um, we've had a century of the most phenomenal technological developments. We've had uh, understanding of biology and medicine that now allows us to fix our problems in a wonderful way. Uh, the well-being of the advanced societies is such that people are living to 80, in my case, now 81 years and relatively healthy. Uh, we know why we do that. We do it, it succeeds and so forth. We have practical knowledge, uh, immense practical knowledge, which is really scientific knowledge. Uh, and the question for uh, Otto Neurath and the Vienna Circle was uh, how do we defend the idea that the sciences are actually giving us knowledge? They call themselves the unity of science movement, uh, but Neurath was on the um, more, what shall I say, a prominent socialist uh, on the idea that much of what we know, we know it because we're a society, we're, we're living in a culture, we're, we're using a language. If we used a different language, things might be different. If we had had different experiences over our lives, there's no doubt in my mind that those different experiences would give us a kind of different character so that we are the product of our society, our lives. Our early experiences all come from our families, uh, our mother initially, big time, the father at a certain phase of life, then friends, then enemies, then work, and everything is creating what we are by giving us experiences which are the things we then use to interpret what we're doing. Um, I think that view of mine is rather substantially larger than the one that the physicists in the Vienna Circle were worrying about, like um, uh, and logicians, Rudolf Carnap. Um, I think uh, Frank was a physicist, and they hoped that it would all come together under the rubric of science somehow, math, Kurt Gödel was a, an occasional attendee at the circle meetings, for example. Uh, their goal was to have the foundations that would produce all of science as a unity. Uh, another occasional visitor was Willard uh, Van Orman Quine from Harvard Philosophy Department, and he came away with a view that knowledge is a, a fabric that is all held together by connections, and we can question some of them, but. Uh, we could tear one connection up and replace it with a stronger one, but we're all building this thing which is like a fabric. And I think I can argue, I think I maybe did maybe mention, well, if not in my blog post today, it's on the uh, page for Otto Neurath. Let's see, here's my Otto Neurath page. Take a quick minute to jump over to this page. And here I point out that some of the scientists were there. So Neurath, I say, was a philosopher of science and a social economist. And with Carnap, Neurath debated the uh, proper use of language uh, in what they hoped to be an anti-metaphysical and holistic foundation of knowledge. And in the book called The Logical Syntax of Language, Carnap declared the distinction between an analytic and a synthetic statement arbitrary. 
something I point out that uh, Quine uh, put into his 1951 essay, The Two Dogmas of Determinism, and here's a quote. And this question of whether language is required for the, uh, for the knowledge base or whether it was, um, uh, in fact, a difficulty uh, to make this knowledge um, the basis uh, comes down to modern times, and I'm not necessarily really modern, but uh, I'm thinking Niels Bohr and the work I'm doing on quantum mechanics and Einstein, Bohr insisted that to understand quantum mechanics, we had to describe its results in classical mechanics language, and that language is critical. And if you couldn't speak about it, you shouldn't try to visualize it. You shouldn't try to speak about it. Now, I believe that Niels Bohr was seriously mistaken in developing what's called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, and I believe I'm, I'm trying to pursue uh, the insight uh, that Albert Einstein tells us he was always looking for, uh, that there are things going on which we may not be able to measure in the first instance because our equipment isn't good enough, but we may not be able to, um, uh, to see things that are going on, but that doesn't mean that things aren't going on. The particular issue was whether particles have a path when they're working their way through an experiment or because we have no knowledge, we have to say that there is no path, and that the path and the position of an object like an electron under a microscope or whatever uh, comes into existence when the conscious observer makes the measurement. This is a highly radical point of view, uh, but it was uh, something that uh, what I'm saying is that uh, the Vienna Circle was right there in those years, meeting from like mid-1920s to the 30s, just during the years in which um, uh, Heisenberg and, uh, and uh, Max Born and Pasquale Jordan and then Bohr were developing uh, the theory we have today of quantum mechanics. Um, I've mentioned before that there are a couple dozen interpretations of quantum mechanics, some of which deny there's anything like a collapse of the wave function, some claiming they'll get rid of all this uncertainty principle nonsense from Heisenberg and they'll reduce everything to determinism and that will satisfy their rule that there's a natural set of laws which make us into uh, entities that are not authors of our actions but are simply a uh, natural uh, material world, giving us the illusion of being thinkers, giving us the illusion of consciousness and giving us the illusion of free will and so forth. I'm hoping to develop some solid arguments against that type of thinking, although it is the predominant thinking in philosophy today, and that's uh, the main reason uh, uh, I, I work hard studying what everyone is saying and trying to present their positions fairly, but also I want to try to present arguments and or evidence in terms of visualizations that I hope will convince you that there's a better way to think about quantum physics than the way it's portrayed in our popular journals today. Okay, so. Uh, I, I say here that Neurath's view is, is similar in many ways to Niels Bohr. Let me bring that to the full screen. And uh, Neurath's image of knowledge as a ship, and this is what we want to really get across today. Um, and let me go back to my first screen here for a moment because I don't want the whole quote that's on my webpage. Uh, well, a moment, I'll go back to my web page. You could read that whole quote with his idea of the ship, which we're talking about today. But here you might like this discussion of his idea of the isotype. Uh, when he left Red Vienna, uh, he had built this thing he called uh, the uh, method of uh, picture. Uh, this is a uh, picture language is better than uh, uh, dead numbers. Uh, but he then uh, left Nazi Germany and renamed the method isotype. And isotype looks good in English. I'm not sure. Maybe he chose English because he was in London at the time. You see, it's the, called the International System of Typographic Picture Education, and it's called isotype. My point here is I want to make this. The idea of communicating ideas with pictures is part of early Lip Ludwig Wittgenstein's work with Bertrand Russell, which was inspired by logical positivism. And I see it as the foundation of my information philosophy, which analyzes the physical arrangement of material particles in any information structure. For me, the structure uh, 
is, is a structure, it's a visible structure, if we can see the arrangement of the material in it and in principle measure exactly where everything is in it and that is the total essential, it is the total content also of the information in an information structure. There were no such things at the very earliest universe, there are today and so I argue an argument, I, I make a case for the development of the material information structures without information informing any of them, they are created only by forces like uh, nuclear forces, electromagnetic forces and uh, gravitational forces eventually. In the first of my three phases, the creation of the material universe. In the second phase of my work, the evolution, the development, the origin of living things, we then have information is at work to manage the arrangement of the particles of matter in our bodies. It takes the energy coming in, which is negative entropy from the sun, to manage our living us as a living thing. And the third phase is for me to make the case for a mind, which many uh, philosophers today deny, and that mind is more or less what the ancients used to think of as a spirit, or a soul, uh, or a self, uh, and a ghost in the machine, as Gilbert Ryle called it. Uh, I want to defend this thing which scientists have attacked for many years. I understand why they attack them, but I want to show you that because we are information structures and active ones, we have such a soul or a self. Anyway, here's the final word from, uh, from uh, Otto Neurath. There's no way to establish fully secured and neat protocol statements as starting points of the sciences. That's his technical work for the uh, unity of sciences. There's no tabula rasa. We are like sailors who have to rebuild their ship on the open sea without ever being able to dismantle it in a dry dock and reconstruct it from its best components. And I think you see that statement, how similar that statement is to the famous problem of the ship of Theseus. Uh, for the ship of Theseus, it was just a problem. Which ship is the real ship? It was a verbal quibble, but it does get to the issue of identity. Identity of that ship over time, it changed. Some skeptics said it wasn't the same ship, like the debtor who said, uh, I borrowed the money. The guy who borrowed the money wasn't me. I'm a different person now. You remember the debtor's paradox, and we'll come back to it again. Um, so uh, I think we see here the ship is uh, our total knowledge, our knowledge base, our sum of all knowledge, I call it. And I am modestly hoping to contribute a great deal of, to that um, uh, base of knowledge with my uh, I now find I have almost 1,500 web pages on uh, information philosopher and growing. I added three in the last two days, including the Neurot, and um, hope to add more going forward. I see we're running out of time. Maybe I'll turn on my music. As I reflect on what we've just done today, let me bring up that, that picture. Uh, and here it is. I have to shrink it down to see what our topic was. The ships of Theseus in the early Greek days, uh, and then the work of Otto Neurath, the great colleague uh, in the Vienna Circle with great thinkers like Ludwig Wittgenstein, Karl Popper, and I think uh, someone who has attempted to get a model of all of our knowledge, and that knowledge then I think if I bring that screen up this way, Neurath wanted pictures as the best way to communicate knowledge. And by sidestepping language, he gets out of this difficulty that I find that language philosophy is fundamentally ambiguous. And people can reinterpret what you're trying to say with words. Uh, I wonder if I can scroll down here for just a moment, pump this screen up a little bit, bring it back again, and you can see my slogan for my work. I think of myself as the information philosopher who wants to get beyond logic and language. 
<laughs> See, it's not easy to make it much larger than that. So thank you very much for being with me today. And I hope you'll find the time to come again or watch me in on-demand uh, videos up on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you and hope to see you again soon.